everybody. I'm Joy Martin. Hey, everyone. I'm Terry Roberts, and Joy and I are part of a nonprofit organization in Huntsville called Intentional Faith. And uh, we're always excited each week to share God's word with you. And uh, today, Joy, hey, we're both excited about this. We're looking at this miracle we of are. Jesus that involves a madman, an army of demons, and a herd of cliff diving pigs. So I think it's going to be kind of interesting today. So uh, before we dive into that, though, let's let's pray. <laughs> I heard Father, that dive in. <laughs> yeah, Father, again, we are so grateful to be in your presence, and we feel your presence here. And Lord, we just pray your blessings over your word today as it speaks truth to us. We pray that you speak that truth in us first and then through us, and we pray for all those who will listen to this, or that they will be blessed, that they will be drawn closer to you and that they will understand more of your word for them and how it applies to them, Father. So bless our time, Lord. We're going to give it to you. And we want, all we want to do is honor and glorify you. And Lord, I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And Joy, I'm going to let you read this uh, rather lengthy scripture for us. <laughs> I know, right? So yeah, this is a little longer. We tried to shorten it, but there's really no way. You need to get the whole uh, picture. So we're going to read this from the message because it's very conversational in the message. Um, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> they arrived on the other side of the sea in the country of the Gerasenes. As Jesus got out of the boat, a madman from the cemetery came up to him. He lived there among the tombs and graves. No one could restrain him. He couldn't be chained, couldn't be tied down. He had been tied up many times with chains and ropes, but he broke the chains, snapped the ropes. No one was strong enough to tame him. Night and day, he roamed through the graves and the hills, screaming out and slashing himself with sharp stones. When he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran and bowed in worship before him, then howled in protest. What business do you have, Jesus, son of the high God, messing with me? I swear to God, don't give me a hard time. Jesus had just commanded the tormenting evil spirit, out, get out of the man. Jesus asked him, tell me your name. He replied, my name is Legion. I'm a rioting mob. Then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish them from the country. A large herd of pigs was grazing and rooting on a nearby hill. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so we can live in them. Jesus gave the order, but it was even worse for the pigs than for the man. Crazed, they stampeded over a cliff into the sea and drowned. Those tending the pigs, scared to death, bolted and told their story in town and country. Everyone wanted to see what had happened. They came up to Jesus and saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes and making sense, no longer a walking madhouse of a man. Those who had seen it told the others what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs. At first, they were in awe. And then they were upset, mm -hmm. upset over the drowned pigs. They demanded that Jesus leave and not come back. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the demon delivered man begged to go along, but he wouldn't let him. Jesus said, go home to your own people. Tell them your story, what the master did, how he had mercy on you. The man went back and began to preach in the Ten Towns area about what Jesus had done for him. He was the talk of the town. Oh, mm. I love that version. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love the message. That's cool. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Terry, set the scene for us because it's important what happened leading up to this and, and some other important facts around this story. It is. Last week, you know, we talked about this miracle of Jesus calming the storm. Mm -hmm. And this was in the, the journey to the other side where this story happens. And Joy, I think you mentioned the fact that 
when we go through the storms of life, as the disciples did here and mm -hmm. Jesus here, God has purpose on the other side if we can endure. And of course, they were able to endure because yeah. Jesus was there with them. And he's yeah. with us, you know, in our storms too. Yeah. So Jesus and the disciples, they crossed the sea you know, through the storm and got to the other side here now. Mm -hmm. So just so we kind of understand the other side is the country of the Gerizines, as the scripture mm -hmm. said. Um, and it's one of just some notes here. It's one of the few areas that Jesus visited that was primarily Gentile. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was primarily Greek. The, and the 10 towns that are mentioned there are the Decapolis. A mm -hmm. lot of scriptures refer to that. And Gezera, one of, it was one of those 10 towns. Um, this is actually it's on the southeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, so it's east of, of Israel, of the country there, which is basically today modern-day Syria, where mm -hmm. they're located, because Damascus was one of those 10 cities of the Decapolis okay. as well. So the significance here, though, of this miracle, and we'll get into this a lot later, is that the followers of Jesus began to expand into this area that was kind of this purpose of the journey through the storm was to mm -hmm. take the message across the the lake there across the sea mm -hmm. so as we've already made the point and, and the scripture said the story begins with this madman mm -hmm. Jesus encounters and you know you can tell from the story he's pretty eerie kind of a figure howls screams cuts himself with stones and he's physically so strong that no one can, right. can contain him. No human power can contain him or bind him or control him. So, and the reason for that is that he is possessed by, by not just a demon, but a legion of demons here. So right. that kind of gets us joy to the question I'm going to throw back to you is, or just the, the topic, tell us, because it's so so cool the interaction between Jesus and the mm -hmm. demon. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that interaction. Yeah, so you know, in looking at this, just reading the scripture alone, without even looking up, you know, what commentaries say or whatever, um, it's clear here to me that the demons know who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. They know that he is the son of God, the son of the high God, you know, it says in the message. Um and um, so there is a knowledge of who he is. They also have a keen awareness that he has absolute power and authority over them. Mm -hmm. uh, something else very interesting that's noted in their exchange is, um, you know, they said, is it time yet? I'm trying to remember how it says it in the message, um, but, you know, is this the appointed time or, you know, is this the end time? Anyway, they also know that in the future, there is an appointed time of final torment for them. They know their impending doom. And Jude 6 tells us, Jude verse 6, um, you also know that the angels who did not keep within their proper domain, but abandoned their own place of residence, he has kept in eternal chains and utter darkness locked up for the judgment of the great day. So the devil and his demons, they have an impending doom set where they will be banished into the abyss, locked up forever and ever. Amen and hallelujah. Their fate mm -hmm. is sealed and they know that. So these demons wonder, is this the time? is this are you coming to end us now um so that's another fact there um to note so they know all about past present future happenings for them and what jesus is doing who jesus is um you talked about legion it's a very an ancient roman army a legion referred to three thousand to six thousand men or you know units in this case so what this shows about this man is he was in some serious serious bondage 
that all these demons had for whatever reason collected here uh, converged in this man. And, you know, maybe they knew Jesus was coming. Who knows? But um, the other thing is, it's interesting that they pleaded to be sent into the pigs. Mm -hmm. And one, um, you know, you think, you know, well, what's that all about? One commentary said, I, I think it was John Piper said, um, they honestly, the demons hate to just roam around, you know, uh, with no host. And so, you know, I'm not sure about all the reasons, but this is one thought that they would rather have any kind of being, whether an animal or human, um, to just cause harm, destruction, and to torment. Um, I mean, that this was so insightful to me that their goal is is like like Jesus says Satan's is to steal, kill, and destroy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's their goal. So they want to do that somewhere. If they can't do that, I mean, they're just like bored because their their mission is to cause torment on people and possibly animals. So they were like, at least send us there. Send us to the pigs because we can still do damage, you know, because that's all they're bent on doing, which, and they're very organized, you know, um anyway so they were like you know at least send us to the pigs what they didn't know that jesus knew <laughs> was that the pigs were going to and i caught you let's dive into this the pigs were gonna um once they had been possessed by these demons they jumped off the cliff into their own destruction but at the same time it's very possible some some um commentators think that um this also sent the demons on ahead into their eternal torment and the abyss you know i don't know for sure you know you can check that out some more um but um anyway so anyhow the thing is i do want to just close this little section with about Jesus interaction with the demons um i think it was c.s lewis and i don't have the exact quote but he said you know Satan or the demons would love us either to completely discount their existence or to be obsessed with their existence. Mm -hmm. And both sides are not good. We know that they are real, that it's mentioned in the Bible. And, and just because it's mentioned in the Bible doesn't mean it's not happening now. So we know that they are real, but to be overly consumed and obsessed over it can also be an unhealthy um, obsession mm -hmm. that we have because ultimately as this story tells us jesus has full authority over all things people spiritual forces everything and that's what you can say wait a minute jesus has authority over this and um so yeah um that's my my little take on that section and dig into that more because some of the things i said are maybe some um insights that some have shared and you know check it out because some are opinions you know based on history or whatever um but all right so terry of course, I already went into this a little bit. Sorry. Why the herd of pigs? How did the people who witnessed this react to the demons being sent into the herd of the pigs in that whole section? Well, like you said, that that's always a question that jumps out to people of why mm. why was it this herd of pigs? And you know, from a, a kind of an obvious answer from a Jewish perspective is that Jesus was casting unclean spirits into unclean animals. Okay. Demons were unclean spirits. To the mm -hmm. Jewish people, the pigs were unclean animals. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, the Jewish culture considered those, those pigs to be unclean. So they would see that as Jesus would just put an unclean with unclean there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But then you got to consider the fact that the demons ask Jesus mm-hmm. to be cast into these pigs. Mm-hmm. And some of the research I did, a lot of scholars feel like, and Joy, just like you were saying, the demons were are here to, to steal, kill, and destroy. Their goal is still to undermine Jesus' ministry here. Right. to undermine what's going on here even though they know who he is they know the power and authority he has over them and they know that ultimately they're going to be cast into the eternal damnation yeah but while they're here they have a go- they have a mission and that's mm-hmm. to undermine Jesus and that's to tear down people and, and right. destroy them so the large herd of pigs was this source of income and livelihood to these people that were there and seeing what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so we see how they then react. I mean, first, of course, they're in all of this incredible miracle, but then reality sets in and they realize their great financial loss here. Mm -hmm. And this man, Jesus, who's come strolling into our country, has done this, taken Mm -hmm. away this source of income for us, and they Mm -hmm. become very angry to the point where they ask Jesus to leave and to never return. And so Mm -hmm. the demons, that's what the demons wanted to happen, is Mm -hmm. to to stop or at least greatly slow down the spreading of the gospel in that area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Jesus saw beyond that, yeah. Jesus already knew that yeah. enough had been done to like at least spark that flame, ignite that flame in that area yeah. so that the word about Jesus would spread. Yeah. Which kind of gets into George, your next question here. How then how did the man respond who had been demon possessed? Now the demons were cast out. How did he respond to the miracle? Yeah, okay, this is my favorite part. You know it is. You know it is. So I'm all excited about this. I'm trying to keep myself contained here. Um, But first of all, let's talk about what changed immediately about just him and his appearance. Um, It says he was sitting there wearing decent clothes and making sense, no longer a walking madhouse of a man. So I do want to say this is not a passage on wearing particular type of clothing, no. what's appropriate, and not appropriate. But the fact um, that he was um, at one point, he was, you know, not just out of sorts. He was once a raging madman running around without clothes and chains or ropes couldn't even contain him. But now he's sitting there clothed and making sense. And in my uh, interpretation. He was cool, calm, and collected. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, you know, something had obviously changed about this man in his um, aura, in his atmosphere, in his presence and appearance. Um, next, I see that he desperately wanted to follow Jesus now. He wanted to even possibly be his disciple because he he wanted to continue walking with this amazing Messiah who had just set his mind and body and soul free. You know, um, here's this man. He knew something miraculous and amazing uh, and just life changing. had happened to him. And he's like, I just want to be with this guy. I just want to keep hanging out with him. Um, but one of my favorite takeaways from this biblical account is Jesus's response to him. Jesus told the man, no, you can't go with me. And and I'm going to paraphrase my own little thing for him. Uh, You can't go with me this time. Uh, One day we'll be together forever. But right now, I want you to do this one important thing for me. This is my kind of paraphrase Mm -hmm. on what Jesus is telling him. And then Jesus said, go home to your own people. Tell them your story, what the master did, how he had mercy on you. And man, I could spend the next hour talking about that, but I'm not for the sake of time right here. But here's what I I will say about this, because this to me 
is such an important part of this passage. Um, so the man responds in just such awe and love, and I just want to be with Jesus now. This man has changed my life. Um, but Jesus, you know, in telling him, uh, you know, you don't have to learn a bunch of formulas or the four spiritual laws, you know, to go share me with other people. He's saying the power of your own story. And if I can look into the camera and say to you listening, the power of your own story, what Jesus means to you and what he has done for you might very well have the most impact on others. And what I love is this man, the most unlikely of individuals became a preacher, a missionary of sorts to his own people. Um, this area, because it was pig farmers, um, all the pig situation and all, you know, it could be that this was a Gentile community, some think, and um, outside the Jewish region. So <laughs> I love that Jesus went beyond his borders uh, outside the walls, and he commissioned the most unlikely of individuals to be the one to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the 10 town region. Uh, that's 10 towns. The Decapolis, is that what you call it? Decapolis, Decapolis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Um, and to me, that's a response worth writing home about, you know, um, this one guy. So, that's how this guy responded. He went and became a preacher to his own people. And his message was, let me just tell you what Jesus has done for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's powerful. That's beautiful. Oh, it is so beautiful. Talk about that a long time amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Terry, we got another miracle coming. All uh, right. What is it? I'll, I'll tell you about, I'll make one point. Just a side note to what you said, that area of the Decapolis, uh -huh. several of Paul's church plants were kind of in that area. Okay. And actually, one of the churches that John writes to the seven churches in Revelation is Philadelphia, which is one of the 10 towns of the Decapolis. Uh, so, okay. Interesting side note for you guys. So, yes. Next week, we're going to do real teasers from now on. So next week, here's what we're looking forward to. A miracle that talks about 12 years of bleeding, which doesn't sound very good, but a persistent faith and the power of a touch. So yeah. if you want to learn more about that, tune in with us next week. We're, we're excited about that. See Enjoy. you next time. Yeah, close us in prayer if you don't mind. Yeah, and if you guys don't mind, um, look us up on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter even now. Um, and, you know, click the like button, like, subscribe um, on YouTube uh, in particular. And you can go to our website at ifhsv.com. Yep. Um, but yeah, just get the word out. Share the word of what Jesus has done for you. And like, mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do here is just, Here's, here's what we know and uh, the, the Jesus we know. All right. Father, thank you for just meeting with us here today. Thank you that you have power and authority over every single thing. And nothing can happen outside of your authority. Oh, Father, I thank you for that. Help us to share our story with people that you put in our path today and in the coming days um, and just use this to just glorify you and bring others home to you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's what we're called to do is share the gospel. So uh, yeah, go, go, go tell the story. That's a, that's a great way to wrap this up. So y'all have a blessed week and we'll see you next time.